Hi, Aide. Good morning, everybody. Buenos días a todos. La doctora Aide Martínez va a introducir hoy a nuestro speaker de honor, el doctor John Chen from Clínica Mayo. Hola. Sí, sí, empiezo. Eh, es un honor para nosotros recibir al doctor Chen. Él se formó en la Universidad de Virginia. Eh, su residencia en oftalmología y su fellowship en neurooftalmología lo hizo en la Universidad de Iowa. Comenzó en la clínica Mayo en el 2014, donde actualmente es consultor de los departamentos de oftalmología y neurología. Es el director del servicio de neurooftalmología de la clínica Mayo profesor asociado del Colegio de Medicina y el director del programa de Fellowship en Neurooftalmología y asociado al programa de residencia. Eh, acá lo vemos cuando vino el, el año pasado al Congreso Conjunto de Oftalmología en Córdoba. Ha recibido numerosos eh, premios de enseñanza, el último el año pasado en la Mayo Clinic como uno de los mejores profesores, lo cual ya había recibido en el año 2016. También ha recibido el Achievement Award de la American Academy of Ophthalmology y elegido como uno de los, eh, para, para desarrollar el programa de líderes también. Ha publicado muchísimos artículos, capítulos de libros, abstract, en general su enfoque clínico se orienta hacia neuritis óptica, hipertensión endocraniana idiopática e imágenes. And also, Sean and Boyd, I want to make our public... Eh, Grateful to you because you received Dr. Macarena Clementi at Mayo Clinic in this pandemic time. And you and your service has given her a very special treatment, both personal and scientific aspect. So thanks. Uh, Macarena maybe is returning now. Uh, and well, Sean, we are ready to hear your lecture. And uh, thanks again for your time. You can begin your lecture. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Let me share my screen here. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I'm incredibly excited to be presenting to Argentina over virtually over Zoom. Um, you know, Argentina has a special place in my heart, and it always will. I had such a good time last year visiting for the Argentine Congress of Ophthalmology where all of the Argentinian neurophthalmologists uh, with Dr. Hede Martinez, Dr. Roberto Ebner, all of them were such gracious hosts. Um, and I, I couldn't have had a better time. And as Dr. Martinez says, over the past couple of months, we've had Dr. Uh, Clementi visit at the Mayo Clinic for the past couple of months. And you know she's been a joy to have. And um, so again, a special place in my heart. There's phenomenal neurophthalmologists in Argentina. And I'm so excited I get to present to all of you today. I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy during this unprecedented time with the coronavirus and hopefully um, things will pass and you know get back to more normal normalcy soon. This morning, what I'd like to do is provide a neuro ophthalmology update on vision loss. And, and the framework I'd like to do that with is a mnemonic called Vindicates. And I'm not sure if this is commonly taught in Argentina, but Vindicates is actually one of the most common mnemonics that we use for approaching any disease process, where each of the letters stands for a class of etiologies. And if you step through each of these letters, these potential etiologies, you're gonna find the diagnosis of the problem. And so I'd like to use this as a framework for approaching vision loss, starting with V for vascular. We'll talk about some infections, neoplasms, and we'll step through all of them. And then if everything is completely normal, there can even be psychological cause of vision loss, which, uh, which is called functional vision loss. What's amazing is just over the past several years, there's been some major advances in, in half of these um, classes of, of vision loss that I'd like to emphasize. So we'll spend more time on these five and we'll briefly touch on the other five. So I'd like to start off with the top. We'll just run down the list. So we'll start off with V, which is vascular. 
And I'd like to approach a lot of these with just a patient, um, just to kind of highlight how these disease processes can affect the vision. So this first case is a 52-year-old male that this patient had three recurrent episodes of transient vision loss in the left eye. And each episode lasted for five minutes. And he described this shade coming over his vision. And as ophthalmologists, we all know that this is concerning for cardioembolic disease with clots shooting up to the eye causing amaurosis fugax. But for a patient, they often ignore these symptoms. They, like, they think, well, the vision came back to normal, everything's fine. But unfortunately, a day before he presented to the neuro-ophthalmology clinic, he developed acute, painless, severe vision loss in the left eye. And when we looked in the eye, that vision was count fingers in the left eye. And when you looked in the left eye, you can see this prominent retinal whitening. And in the center at the fovea, you see the classic chair red spot. And then if you look at the arterioles, you can see this calcified plaque right at the bifurcation of the artery, um, central retinal artery, right at the, at the optic nerve. And this is consistent, of course, with the central retinal artery occlusion. You can see on fluorescein, this prominent delay in the filling of the arterioles. And again, this is a central retinal artery occlusion. So anytime we have a patient with amaurosis or retinal artery inclusion, it's cardioembolic until proven otherwise. And therefore they need that stroke workup. And it's an urgent stroke workup. They need imaging of the carotid arteries. They need to, we need to check the heart, make sure that the rhythm is good. Ideally it would be a 48 hour Holter monitor. And then we'd have to check the heart and the heart valves with an echocardiogram. And ideally that'd be a trans esophageal echocardiogram because it has higher resolution than a trans thoracic echocardiogram. And for many of these patients, we might consider an MRI of the brain and an MRA of the head and neck um, to see if there's any evidence of prior ischemia to the brain. Rarely, uh, giant cell arteritis can actually cause central retinal artery occlusions. So anytime I see a patient with a central retinal artery occlusion or patient with transient vision loss, I think they require screening for ESR, CRP if they're over the age of 60 and you don't see a plaque in the arterioles because you don't want to miss John's arteritis. Over the past several years, there's been a lot of studies looking at the risk of stroke associated with retinal artery occlusions. And the bottom line is all of these studies have found that there is a strong association between CNS brain strokes and retinal artery occlusions. And it's not surprising because the mechanism is the same for the vast majority. The vast majority are gonna be cardioembolic. We looked at this in a large cohort at the Mayo Clinic of 300 patients. And we found that 5% of patients with a central retinal artery occlusion had a symptomatic stroke within a month of that artery occlusion. So again, in our minds, it really is, if you've got a retinal artery occlusion, this is a stroke to the retina. It's got the same mechanisms as a stroke to the brain. They need that urgent workup. And what's interesting is 20% even had signs of asymptomatic stroke on MRI, acute stroke. And so again, central retinal artery occlusion equals stroke. And that's been the new paradigm shift. So one of the biggest updates I want you to take away from this talk is retinal artery occlusion equals stroke. And this was actually adopted by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, published in the preferred practice pattern. And essentially what they, they are recommending is if you have a acute central retinal artery occlusion, they require that urgent referral to the ED to do a workup for cardioembolic disease especially imaging of the carotid arteries because the risk of recurrent um, stroke for carotid artery in a short period of time is actually pretty high. Whereas if you have atrial fibrillation, the risk of a stroke is more spread out over time. Another update, and this actually hasn't even been published yet, but it's an update that we've been doing some research on is this interesting phenomenon that I want to highlight with this case. This is a patient with a branch retinal artery occlusion in the left eye. And of course, with any retinal artery occlusion, we're gonna do the cardioembolic workup. As you can see from the MRA, 
um, which was also found on the carotid ultrasound, this patient had some stenosis of the carotid artery. You can see my cursor here in the left internal carotid artery. It was stenotic, but it was about 50% stenosis. And typically when we think about um, carotid disease causing retinal artery occlusions, the classic teaching is that the more stenosis, stenosis of 70%, 90%, those are the ones that tend to shoot embolic disease up from the carotid. But as you can see here, this patient only had 50% stenosis. So the question is, you know, was that carotid disease enough to cause the, the, the retinal artery occlusion or was there something else? What we've been looking at from a research perspective is looking at MP RAGE protocol, which is a specific MRI um, kind of imaging protocol that you can do to look for hyperintense plaques. And what you can see here in that carotid artery, even though it only has 50% stenosis, you can see these two large hyperintense plaques. And these actually represent hemorrhagic unstable plaques. And there's been studies in the stroke literature suggesting that the, these are much more unstable and they can shoot clots up to the brain and cause strokes. And we did an analysis of patients with retinal artery occlusions, and we found a large percentage of them also had these hemorrhagic unstable plaques. And therefore, I think in terms of etiology, the amount of stenosis is still important. But even if there's a smaller amount of stenosis, I think it's important to look for these potential unstable plaques because these could potentially explain many of these previously idiopathic retinal artery occlusions. Essentially, when we do the full cardioembolic workup, if we don't find anything, sometimes we'll call them idiopathic. But I think you know many of these may be explained by these hemorrhagic unstable plaques. And the other percentage of idiopathic are probably patients that intermittently go to atrial fibrillation that we miss in the 24-hour or 48-hour ultra monitor. Some of those patients will even do 30-day monitoring to try and catch that intermittent atrial fibrillation. But I think these unstable plaques are going to be a more recognized phenomenon in the future. But again, um, very, very new and, and uh, certainly in the research phases still, but it'd be nice to be able to... Uh, to confirm this in the future. But it's certainly involving the stroke literature that is the case. <clears throat> All right, next I'd like to talk about non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, another vascular cause of vision loss. It's the most common acute optic neuropathy over the age of 50. And by definition, it's anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So by definition, there has to be disc edema. And so here's a classic patient with NAION with this superior hyperemia, uh, some peripapillary hemorrhages and disc edema. And classically, this, the, as, as many of these patients, this patient had an inferior altitudinal defect in that right eye. And another classic feature in the left eye, which is unaffected, you can see that the cup to disc ratio is very small, um, really less than 0.1. So this patient had a very congested optic nerve, the so-called called disc at risk. And this is just uh, for anyone who, obviously all the ophthalmologists know the cup to disc ratio, but for anyone non-ophthalmology specialist, this just kind of shows some spectrums of, of cup to disc ratio where this is a very congested optic nerve, the ones you typically see in NAON, um, where you've got a very small cup to disc ratio. This is a patient who is a glaucoma suspect where the cup takes up 75% of the nerve. And this is a patient with definite glaucoma. You can see the severe cupping with cupping taking up 95% of the nerve. This is important uh, in NAON because it's probably the number one risk factor. And the thought is that with the congested optic nerve, there's not much space for the blood vessels. And that's what increases the risk of that hypoperfusion ischemia to the optic nerve. And it's because it's so congested there. Whereas in this patient, who's a glaucoma suspect with a big nerve, you can see there's a lot of space for the blood vessels. So it'd be unusual or unlikely for a patient with glaucoma to develop NAON. It's typically about 90% of patients have this very congested optic nerve. The classic presentation for NAON is sudden painless unilateral vision loss. It's all often noticed upon awakening, but can happen anytime during the day. 
But again, it should be predominantly painless. And it's due to ischemia to the optic nerve head supplied by the short, short posterior ciliary arteries. Um, one of the theories behind it is that there is nocturnal hypotension. Our blood, blood pressure tends to drop when we sleep. And one of the theories is that you get transient hypoperfusion to the optic nerve, which leads to the swelling of the optic nerve. And that further impedes the blood supply to the nerve, and then you get drops in vision. Another important distinction from NAION from a central retinal artery occlusion is that NAION is hypoperfusion ischemic to the nerve. It's not cardioembolic disease. So for the most part, if you have a classic case of NAION, you don't have to check the heart or the neck for clots, because again, it's not embolic disease, unlike retinal artery occlusions. Really, the risk factors are vascular risk factors. Of course, the congested optic nerve, but then the vascular risk factors like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Sleep apnea is probably a risk factor as well. And phosphodiesterase inhibitors like Viagra, Cialis, those are probably risk factors as well. Low, low risk, but probably potentially contributes to NAON to a small degree. Again, it's the most common cause of acute optic neuropathy in older patients. So as ophthalmologists, we're all going to see this, regardless of whether you're a neuro-ophthalmologist or a general ophthalmologist, you're going to see a patient with any one because it's so common. And a patient's always going to want to, these three questions are going to be on the top of their mind. You know, what are my chances it's going to improve? What are my chances it's going to worsen? And what are my chances it's going to come back? And so these are essentially the numbers I tell them. Uh, because we don't have a very good treatment for NAION, we actually know the natural history of the disease very well. And about 40% of patients will get a little bit of improvement over six months. And it's unfortunately, it's a mild improvement. Um, it's unlike optic neuritis, where you can go from no light perception back to 2020. With, with NAION, um, the vision loss tends to get better by you know two or three lines. Uh, if they're going to improve. And then the visual field improves by, you know, 10 to 20%. They're not going to get all their vision back classically. Unfortunately, 20% can actually even worsen. And that usually happens during the first month when the optic nerve is swollen. It's, it's impairing that blood flow to the optic nerve. And so they can sometimes get second hits or third hits while the nerve is swollen. And then when they get an ischemic hit, the nerve gets even more swollen and it can lead to more attacks. So that happens at about 20% of patients. And then the chance of recurrence in the same eye is actually lower. It's only 5% in terms of the same eye. The theory behind that is, is that after an ischemic event, you actually, um, some of the nerve tissue actually dies off and it creates more space for the blood vessels. So the chance of it happening in the, in the same eye is actually lower at 5%. Whereas, in the other eye, the unaffected eye still has that congested optic nerve appearance, and therefore there's a 20% chance of it happening in that eye. And so these are some percentages that patients will want to know because, you know, it's pretty scary to lose vision in one eye, and they just want to know who, what's going to happen in the future. And again, because we don't have a good treatment, we know the natural history very well. Um, we've tried multiple treatments in the past. Um, we've done, um, in the 90s, we did the ischemic optic neuropathy decompression trial, where we actually tried optic nerve sheath fenestration to try and decompress the optic nerve. Ultimately, the outcomes were worse in the surgical group, and therefore, we don't recommend optic nerve sheath fenestration for these patients. Systemic cortical steroids has been um, potentially used. We do know that it decreases the amount of swelling it decreased the amount of swelling more quickly, but whether it actually improves vision is highly controversial. Um, there are some, the minority of neuroophthalmologists use steroids. Um, there's been some recent studies suggesting that perhaps it's not as effective as we had hoped. And so I think the minority of patients of, of neuroophthalmologists use steroids for NAON. For me, if it's a second eye severe vision loss, you know, I might use steroids, but for the first eye, I don't typically do it. And really the main thing is you wanna optimize your vascular risk factors, treat sleep apnea, 
you want to try and stack everything in their favor to try and prevent it from happening again in the other eye. All right, so we're going to switch gears from NAION to this patient who has something else. So this patient, um, when I saw them, was 2,400 in both eyes. And this patient was actually diagnosed with NAION locally when they lost vision in the right eye. And then, um, they, again, they were diagnosed with NAION. They've got a lot of vascular risk factors. Uh, but then, unfortunately, they lost vision in the left eye two weeks later. And when I saw them this one day after the vision loss of the left eye, you can see that um, there is bilateral disc edema. But the disc edema is different than what you typically see with the NA NAION. And in my mind, this can only be one thing um, because of that pallid disc edema. In my mind, this is arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy from giant cell arteritis, or at least some kind of vasculitic process. You know, it looks very different. This, this appearance of the optic nerve looks very different from that classic NAION that I showed. You know, here you've got the hyperemic disc edema. Here you've got the pallid disc edema. So anytime you see pallid disc edema, that's not ischemia to the nerve, that's essentially infarction to the nerve. And so then I go down a pathway of a vasculitic process causing arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. And the vast majority of these are gonna be giant cell arteritis. And here you can see a fluorescein angiogram and what you can see here is some pretty prominent delayed cortical filling, which is also um, essentially pathognomonic for arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy with delayed filling of the uh, choroid because the posterior ciliary arteries are, are occluded. So this patient had a sed rate and a C-reactive protein that were both elevated. Uh, we gave her immediate um, high-dose IV steroids, uh, and we got a temporary biopsy, which confirmed our suspicion of giant cell arteritis. Unfortunately, the vision remained 2,400 in both eyes. The frustrating part about this case is that, um, you know, the, the vision loss in the left eye could have been pre prevented if, if the patient was recognized to have giant cell arteritis when they had lost vision in the right eye. Um, occasionally, these patients will lose vision loss, have vision loss bilaterally simultaneously, and there's nothing you can do. But if you lose one eye first, that can give you time to potentially save the other eye. That's why this disease is so important to recognize. So giant cell arteritis um, is a granulomatous inflammation of large and medium-sized blood vessels. Uh, it's the most common primary vasculitis in adults in the Western world. It's more prevalent in Northern latitude. It's three times more common in women. Um, in Minnesota, where the Mayo Clinic is, uh, we have a lot of, of patients, a lot of our um, population is from the Scandinavian countries, from Sweden, Finland. Uh, and so we see a lot of giant cell arteritis, but it really it can affect any age, any race, uh, or any race, any gender. But really, the biggest risk factor is age. Um, the median age is 75. Uh, it's very rare in patients less than 50. And, and really, I don't know of any cases of arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy from giant cell arteritis in patients less than 50. I think we all know the classic systemic symptoms. It's going to be headaches, scalp tenderness, jaw claudication. Um, jaw claudication is probably the most specific symptom of giant cell arteritis, but you really have to tease apart jaw pain because a lot of jaw pain, you know, when they bite down and it hurts for the very first bite, that's typically going to be TMJ. But if a patient says, you know, I bite down, there's no pain, but after about 30 seconds, after about a minute of chewing, then my jaw gets really sore. That's claudication. And if they have true jaw claudication, that's a very specific symptom for giant cell arteritis, and I'm very suspicious for it. Unlike headache, you know, that might be one of the most common symptoms of giant cell arteritis. Headache is just so common in patients, it's, it's not that specific. Um, patients can also have malaise, anorexia, weight loss, fever, joint and muscle pain. It affects, you know, all blood, large blood vessels in the body. So it can even cause stroke in about three to 4%, typically the vertebral arteries that are affected. It can cause aortitis and can lead to aneurysm. 
And of course, the reason we care about ophthalmology is the ophthalmic manifestations, which range anywhere between 14 to 70 percent. It's probably, you know, about 14 to 15 percent of patients truly have ophthalmic manifestations, but it's it can be devastating when it does. And it can cause ischemia to any part of the eye, but the most common way it presents in the eye is arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. It can really cause double vision as well. And um, it does so by, it can affect the cranial nerves or it can cause ischemia to the muscles where, and so therefore it can cause any kind of pattern of double vision. Um, so any patient over the age of 60 who has new onset double vision, Johnson water should be on the differential diagnosis. And one of the um, potentially scary things as ophthalmologists is that you can have ophthalmic manifestations but no systemic symptoms of headache, scalp tenderness, jaw claudication in up to 21% of patients. Um, we found that in one of our studies at the Mayo Clinic and Dr. Hayre at the University of Iowa also found a similar number. So the fact that 20% can sneak in there with vision loss without headaches or jaw claudication, um, it, it just has to be on your radar. And so pretty much any patient who comes in with ischemic optic neuropathy over the age of 60, I screened for said rate C-reactive protein, CBC, because I feel like we just can't miss gyncoarteritis. And again, 20% can have no systemic symptoms. So the reason gyncoarteritis typically affects the eye is it causes inflammatory occlusion of the posterior ciliary arteries. And this is what supplies the optic nerve head. It also supplies to choroid, which is why we saw the delayed choroidal filling in our patient that we introduced gyncoarteritis with. The most common way that gyncoarteritis causes vision loss is arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Um, and this accounts for 85% of the vision loss in GCA. Two thirds of patients are gonna have that classic pallid disc edema, but that means a third of patients are gonna have a hyperemic looking ischemic optic neuropathy. So you can't depend on the pallid disc edema, but if you see it, that's gonna be gyncoarteritis. It's not gonna be NAION. Unfortunately, the vast majority of patients have pretty profound vision loss at onset, um, about two thirds with 2,200 or worse. About 14% of vision loss from gyncoarteritis is, is actually through central retinal artery occlusions. Overall, gyncoarteritis only accounts for about 1% of central retinal artery occlusions, so it's a pretty overall percentage of central retinal artery occlusion. Um, but if you do have a patient with it, it accounts for about 14% of the vision loss in GCA. Because the ciliary artery is supplied by the posterior ciliary arteries, you can also get a ciliary artery occlusion. And so this is a patient who, again, is pathognomonic for giant arteritis because they had both pallid disc edema from arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and also um, this huge cotton wool spot from this ciliary artery occlusion. So again, this is pathognomonic for giant arteritis. It can cause choroidal ischemic lesions and ocular ischemic syndrome as well. You know, we're all classically taught this, um, the clinical diagnosis from the American College of Rheumatology, where um, they report uh, sensitivity and specificity that's pretty good if you have three of the following, age of onset over the age of 50, a new headache, temporal artery abnormalities, elevated set rate, and a positive temporary biopsy. Of course, this is the gold standard. If this is positive, you know, that's going to be gyncoarteritis. But recent studies suggest that these criteria are a little bit less sensitive and specific. Um, and um, there was an interesting study. Uh, we were part of this collaboration that was led by Dr. Edso Ng up in Canada, where uh, we took a lot of patients with gyncoarteritis and tried to come up with a predictive model for how likely it is a patient will have a positive temporary biopsy. And um, Dr. Ng actually created this calculator that's actually available online for free, where you can actually take a patient, plug in all the demographics and characteristics and determine, well, what are my chances that this is gonna be gyncoarteritis? And so there's a patient who's 87, they're female, they've got new onset headaches, um, a C-reactive protein that's elevated, but everything else looks pretty good. No jaw claudication, no vision loss. 
And so essentially this is older patient, elevated CRP, headaches. We Overall, we found that this patient would have about a 12% chance of giant arteritis. Of course, this would be enough to do a temporary biopsy, but headache alone is just not that specific, but obviously this patient would need a biopsy. In contrast, this is a patient now, they've got headache, but they also have jaw claudication. They also have an elevated platelets. And now all of a sudden with this jaw claudication, you've got a 50% chance this patient has giant cell arteritis because again, that's a much more specific symptom. And um, so you know, I think this calculator is helpful. And of course, just your clinical gestalt is very helpful as well. Uh, I would keep a very low threshold for looking for giant cell arteritis because the, the risk of missing it can be catastrophic. If you suspect Johnson arteritis, it's essentially immediate steroids. There's no randomized trial comparing IV steroids to oral steroids, but there's vision loss. I tend to use a high dose IV methylprednisolone 1000 milligrams for three days, followed by uh, 80 milligram prednisone with a very slow taper. Unfortunately, when you have vision loss, the steroids doesn't typically reverse the vision loss. Really the steroids are to prevent the vision loss in the other eye. Just like in the patient that, again, I used to introduce Johnson arteritis, they lost vision in one eye. They didn't lose vision in the other eye until two weeks later. So if that patient had been recognized, treated with steroids, um, it would have prevented bilateral blindness. And um, really the gold standard for diagnosing Johnson arteritis is the temporary biopsy. And we typically recommend getting the biopsy within two weeks of starting the steroids. If, if, if it's after two weeks, the steroids can sometimes wash away some of the inflammation, so it's hard to get that, that positive result. But within two weeks, uh, the inflammation still should still be there. So don't let um, the delay in temporary artery biopsy delay the treatment. If you're suspecting Johnson arteritis, you treat them with steroids, then you get the temporary biopsy. And then these patients need a long prednisone taper, often over six months or a year because it just takes a long time for the smoldering inflammation to resolve. And so we've known for about giant cell arteritis for many, many years, and obviously the mainstay of treatment is steroids. But a nice update in giant cell arteritis, uh, this came out in 2017 in the New England Journal of Medicine, which was a randomized trial showing that tocilizumab, an IL-6 inhibitor, uh, when used in prednisone, allowed for a fastering taper of the steroids. And so this is a nice um, steroid sparing agent that's FDA approved that we can use for our patients to help get them off steroids quicker because obviously prednisone has a lot of side effects. Um, you never use this in isolation. You can use this with prednisone, but again, it can help get the prednisone off quicker. All right, very briefly, I'm just gonna talk on the last vascular cause of vision loss, which is posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. This is pretty rare, but you occasionally see it. Um, this is acute ischemic damage to the retrobulbar portion of the nerve. And so therefore the nerve, when you look in, will actually look normal at first. Later on, they will develop pallor. But when you look in, you won't have that disc edema that you get with anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. This is much more rare than anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, and it's essentially a diagnosis of exclusion. I only see it in three scenarios. Um, probably the most common would be immediately post-operative. So uh, in the classic surgery, spine surgery with the head down position for 12 hours, they can sometimes wake up bilaterally blind. Um, it's, it can be catastrophic, and there's really it's really hard to predict. It's hard to prevent. Um, but it can be pretty catastrophic. And so that's, that's probably the most common time that we see posterior ischemic optic is post-surgical. You can get it in giant cell arteritis as, as well. Um, just, it's just uh, inflammatory occlusion just further back so the nerve doesn't swell. And then uh, occasionally maybe there's a non-arteritic posterior ischemic optic neuropathy variant I actually haven't seen this before. Um, every time I think I've got a patient who has posterior ischemic optic neuropathy who doesn't have giant cell arteritis, no recent blood loss, um, no recent surgery, I end up finding an alternative etiology. And um, 
So that's going to be certainly a diagnosis of exclusion. You know, every patient needs an MRI, a complete workup, unless it's, of course, post-operative. Okay. I know we spent half an hour just going through the vascular causes, but the, the rest are, go a little bit quicker. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask, and we can chat about things along the way. Um, but otherwise, we'll just jump into the next one, which is infection. So this is an interesting patient um, who presented with vision loss in the left eye. Um, you can see here, um, and they also had rash and some other symptoms. And you can see here that the vision in the left eye was 2070. The vision in the right eye was 2025. But when you look in, your attention is immediately drawn to the disc edema in the right eye, whereas the left eye actually looks fairly normal. But if you get an OCT through the macula, that's where it becomes more obvious where the vision loss is coming from. In the right eye, you can see the photoreceptors, the ellipsoid zone is intact. Whereas in the left eye, you can see that the photoreceptors and the ellipsoid zone is completely disrupted. And so if you look closely, you can see that there's this placoid chorioretinitis chorio lesion. And that's essentially pathognomonic for syphilis which is a, a, an infection that can affect any part of the eye. And this patient was positive for RPR, TPPA, and the CSF VDR was positive. So this patient had CNS syphilis. And what's amazing about this disease is if you catch it and you treat it early, <clears throat> you can have really good outcomes. So this patient was treated with IV penicillin and we're, we saw them back two weeks later. And you can see that the, the vision improved at 2025, the disc edema is markedly better. And you can see that the photoreceptors actually were restored. And this is the OCT at baseline. And this is the um, OCT two weeks later and just had phenomenal recovery. So if you catch it early enough, you can reverse the damage. If the photoreceptors are disrupted for too long, even with treatment, you can have permanent damage and vision loss. Uh, the reason why it's important um, to think about syphilis is really the rates of syphilis have been going up in 2000, um, not only, only in the US, but really around the world. So it's just something that we have to think about because it can affect any part of the eye and it's very treatable. I'd like to talk about this infection here. Um, this is the classic neuroretinitis with the macular star. You can see the disc edema here and that classic stellate appearance of the macular star. And these patients typically present with acute vision loss with disc edema. And then one to two weeks later, they develop this um, macular star, which are the exudates. The vision typically recovers, and classically it's caused by Bartonella from catch scratch disease. And so, um, you know, it, you wanna ask about cats because that's the most common cause of neuroretinitis, but other causes include syphilis, Lyme, sarcoid, toxo TB and viruses. I thought this was an interesting patient. Um, this is actually a patient with neuroretinitis, but they're referred for papillitis in the right eye. They're 2050 in the right eye, 2020 in the left. And when you can look, you can see why the fundus looks like papillitis. You've got this optic disc edema there. You don't see a macular star. But what's interesting, if you do an OCT through the macula, you can see this prominent subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid. And lo and behold, two weeks later, you can see the macular star. So, uh, you know, I think it's just important to keep in mind neuroretinitis in its acute setting you often won't have that macular star. It's just gonna be subretinal fluid. So if you see a swollen optic nerve, subretinal fluid and intraretinal fluid, you can think, well, possibly this is gonna be a neuroretinitis. And OCT can pick that up for us. Um, this is a case of Lyme choroiditis and papillitis. Um, you can see bilateral disc edema and then these deep chordal yellow lesions kind of were the tip off. And Lyme is also one of the diseases, uh, infections that can affect any part of the eye, um, as are TB, HIV, and zoster. Okay. We're going to move on to N, which is neoplasm. This is a 53-year-old with slow, painless vision loss in the right eye. Anytime anyone has slow, progressive vision loss in one eye, I'm thinking compression until proven otherwise. You can see there's mild disc edema in the right eye, 
and this constricted visual field, especially temporally. And of course, the next step from anyone I'm concerned about compressive optic neuropathy is imaging. And here you can see the classic meningioma here, um, an optic nerve sheath meningioma, where the optic nerve sheath enhance, enhances, whereas the optic nerve itself is not enhancing. So it's really that sheath, the optic nerve sheath meningioma. Um, and so this is the bullseye sign. This is called the tram track sign. Kind of looks like railroads there where the sheath enhances. And what's important is you want to get an MRI with contrast with fat saturation or suppression of the orbits, because otherwise you can't see it. So this is uh, uh, an MRI without fat suppression and, and the meningioma is completely invisible where it's so obvious here with the enhancement um, with the fat saturation. Same thing on the axial cuts. It's just invisible here. And so I've, we've certainly seen patients who quote unquote have a normal MRI when we see them, but they don't have these orbital cuts. And so you've got to just make sure you have these orbital cuts before you can rule out the possibility of an optic nerve sheath meningioma. Um, these patients present with painless, slowly progressive vision loss. They can have gaze evoke amaurosis at times where when they move their eye, the vision can actually transiently black out. Uh, they can have optic atrophy, discodema, chordal folds, and optal ciliary shunt vessels. Um, it, it typically affects women in the 40s to 50s, but it really it can affect um, any age, typically older though. And again, you want to look for that tram track sign and MRI. And the treatment is stereotactic radiation if you have patients with progressive vision loss. The other common tumor affecting the optic nerve is the optic pathway glioma. And it can affect the optic nerve, chiasm, or both. And here's an example of a patient actually I just saw last week. And you can see that this is an optic pathway glioma as opposed to an optic nerve sheath meningioma because it actually is a is the entire nerve is enhancing because the tumor is actually within the nerve itself. It's not just the sheath. And so that's how you can differentiate the two. It's typically detected in the first decade of life, 90% by the second decade of life. Patients can present with proptosis, vision loss, optic disc pallor, or disc edema, and they can sometimes have strabismus. There's a very strong association between optic pathway gliomas and neurofibromatosis type one. And so anytime you've got an optic pathway glioma, you have to look for other signs of NF1, like Lish nodules and other things like that. All right, we'll very briefly touch on drugs and toxins. Really the most common ones that, we, that come to mind um, for toxic optic neuropathy would be ethambutol and linazolid. Ethambutol uh, is by far the most common. They both pre present with this progressive bilateral sequel central scotoma optic nerve pallor develops over time. Amiodrone presents in a different way. It presents with disc edema, um, and it looks actually very similar to NAAION, um, but it's more often bilateral, um, and the vision loss sometimes can be more subacute. And then you've got methanol and ethylene glycol. These patients present with acute vision loss. So these are just some various toxic optic neuropathies, and again, they present very differently Ethamutil, very slow, progressive, or subacute vision loss over, you know, weeks. Um, and then amiodarone looks more like NaON, and then methanol, ethylene glycol, very acutely. I is, stands for idiopathic, and here I'd like to talk about idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So this is just a classic patient, patient with IH. It's a 23-year-old female with headaches. Also reports hearing her heartbeat in her ears, which is pulse tingitis tinnitus. Also reported that the vision blacks out for a couple of seconds at a time, which is transient visual obscurations. She also reported 30 pounds of weight gain over the past six months and is very obese, a BMI of 35. And these are all classic for IIH. On exam, she's 20-20 in both eyes, but you can see this profound um, papilledema, grade four papilledema in both eyes. And on visual field, she just has an enlarged blind spot in both eyes and a small nasal step in the left eye. So here you're already going to be thinking that this is going to be papilledema and raised intracranial pressure because if this were some kind of optic, other optic neuropathy like NAION or optic neuritis, you'd expect the vision or visual fields to be much more affected. <laughs> 
So this patient, obviously, we're going down the IH pathway. We need neuroimaging. We need lumbar puncture. And the order you want to do is neuroimaging before lumbar puncture. Because if they have a huge tumor, that can obviously cause papilledema. And if you do a lumbar puncture before you know about that huge tumor, you could even theoretically cause herniation in the brain. So really, it's neuroimaging before LP if we're suspecting papilledema and raised intracranial pressure. And in terms of the imaging, the gold standard would be an MRI and an MRV. An MRI to look for any structural causes, MR venogram to look for any venous sinus thrombosis. And you know these, these imagings are important to rule out tumor, hydrocephalus, any kind of structural causes of raised intracranial pressure. And you can also use them to look for indirect signs of raised pressure. Um, and I just have some examples here, the empty cella, um, dilated optic nurses, flattened globes, and the MRV, you can see some narrowing of the transverse sinuses. These are just all indirect signs of raised pressure to help confirm your suspicion that there's raised pressure. And then the lumbar puncture is there to measure the opening pressure. Um, but more importantly, you, you want to rule out infectious inflammatory neoplastic processes. So that's the classic workup. Before you can make a diagnosis of IH, need the imaging, need the lumbar puncture, and in that order. So IH is, um, by definition, papilledema of rate and raised intracranial pressure of unknown cause. Um, we don't know the actual cause, but we know the demographics. It's 90% are female, 90% are obese, 90% are going to be the age between 15 and 45. And these patients typically present with headaches, pulsing or dystinnitus, transient visual obscurations. They can have horizontal double vision because of six nerve palsies. You also want to ask about um, possible um, things that can contribute to raised pressure, like vitamin A toxicity, retinoic acid, atra, tetracyclines. All of these can potentially cause raised intracranial pressure. Um, there, they wouldn't necessarily be idiopathic anymore, but um, could still cause raised pressure. So there's a high dependency of IH on obesity, and it's, and it's pretty striking what obesity has been doing over the past several years. This is the, the percentage of patients with obesity in the US, and you can see it just marches higher, higher, and higher. And that's happening around the world. And in 2030, they're projecting that 50% of the US is going to be obese. And that's important because obesity is probably the number one risk factor for IH other than have, being female. And we actually looked at the incidence of IH over um, and compared it to the incidence you know, 20, 30 years ago when there was less obesity. And you can see that the incidence has doubled over the past 20 years, which corresponds very nicely to that rise in obesity. And so we're going to be seeing it a lot more um, just because of the obesity pandemic that is uh, really around the world. Um, IH can cause permanent vision loss in up to 40% of the patients, and that's why we care about it as ophthalmologists. And so these patients need serial follow-up with visual fields. The treatments are weight loss. Uh, medications are acetazolamide or topiramate, and there's surgery for vision-threatening disease. Um, the recent study published in JAMA in 2014 looked at acetazolamide compared to placebo to see if the treatment that we've been using for decades truly works. And the good part is, is, is it does. Um, the acetazolamide actually improved the papilledema grade faster than placebo, and it actually improved visual function more than placebo as well. And just from this study, we have already 24 articles, four editorials, and there's more to come. So this study was very important. And then there's surgery. And this is really for three main scenarios. One is fulminant IH, where they come in with grade five papilledema, where if you don't treat them, they're going to go blind immediately. Those are ones where we consider surgery. We also consider it for patients who are on extended max medical therapy and weight loss efforts, and they continue to have persistent disc edema. We'll consider it there, but that'd be obviously much less urgent. And then patients with significant papilledema who have functional overlay, so I can't actually tell what's happening with the vision. That's another scenario where I might consider surgery. And the classic surgeries are a VP shunt and optic nerve sheath fenestration. And recently, we've been doing a lot of venous sinus stenting. 
Um, and so here's just an example of venous sinus stenting. Um, this is a patient who had prominent transverse sinus stenosis. And with venous sinus stenting, you actually deploy a stent in that stenosis, and you can see that it increases um, the blood flow away from the brain. And we've done about 130 cases at the Mayo Clinic. And I don't think there's been a single case where the papilledema did not improve. And so it's, it's certainly something that we've been doing a lot more of. Um, I don't do it in my cases of fulminant IH because patients have to be on Plavix for three months. So if this venous science stenting fails, they might not be able to do another surgical procedure because of the Plavix. But I, we do do um, a lot more venous sinus stenting than we used to. And again, outcomes are, have been pretty good. Just want to touch briefly on papilledema versus pseudopapilledema. You know, which one is real, which one is fake? And, uh, you know, here, both of these nerves are a little bit swollen looking, but, but one of these is actually pseudopapilledema. And so this is a, just an example, an eight-year-old girl referred for bilateral optic disc edema. But here on ultrasound, you can see this uh, hyper intense echogenic lesion here. And this is classic for optic disc drusen or pseudopapilledema, one of the most common causes of pseudopapilledema. Obviously, in an older patient, it becomes calcified much easier to see, but early on, it can be hard. And therefore, ancillary tests are very helpful, um, like ultrasound, OCT, other things to try and find it. I'm just going to jump through this one real quick. Um, I think another useful way of possibly using OCT to help differentiate papilledema from other causes is looking at that Brooks membrane complex. This is a patient with you know severe papilledema and you can see that that Brooks membrane complex is angled upward and after lumbar puncture it dropped back down to a more neutral position. And so this is something that you can look at to kind of help you know determine is this potentially raised pressure and how are they responding to therapy. Another way OCT is helpful is in this patient. This patient actually I just saw yesterday was referred for optic disc edema in the right eye. You can see here that that nerve does look a little bit swollen. There are 20, 20 full visual fields. Um, you can see that the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness is just a little bit elevated in that right eye. But with the five line raster through that optic nerve head, you can see here these prominent vitreous strands and so this is a case of vitreal papillary attraction causing pseudopapilledema. And so I think OCT can be your friend when you're trying to differentiate papilledema from pseudopapilledema. Um, and then these are just some other ways of kind of differentiating, differentiating them. I think if you see patent lines, that's very helpful. Um, same thing with choroidal folds. Um, and the choroidal folds, I find that the MAC of a thickness map on OCT is very helpful for demarcating them. And of course, if you see parapapillary hemorrhages, you're not going to see that in pseudopapilledema. The last thing I want to chat about in terms of papilledema and race intracranial pressure is this interesting, um, newly described uh, phenomenon called spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome or SANS. And essentially, what we're finding is that astronauts, when they go to space, and these are fit men and women, um, they can develop glow flattening choral folds and optic disc edema or papilledema. And again, these aren't your demographic of your patient with IH with a BMI of 35. These are fit, very fit men and women. I've been uh, collaborating with some scientists at NASA and we're trying to look at potential risk factors for this. And what's interesting is that many astronauts with papilledema are found to have a specific polymorphism um, that we consider risk alleles. And so here you can see that in patient, in astronauts without that risk allele, none of them develop papilledema. And here a third of the ones with that risk allele develop that papilledema. And um, so we've been looking at patients with IH um, on earth to see if perhaps the same polymorphism is gonna be contributing to our patients with IH. And so that's an ongoing collaboration. Another um, very interesting study, um, the best mechanism or way of actually um, trying to mimic space flight is actually a head down tilt position where volunteers on earth are actually volunteering to go head down um, for extended periods of time and they actually develop papilledema. 
uh, or disk edema at least um, without. And so that was published by this nice group out of NASA where after about 10 to 20 days, they actually start developing disk edema. And so we looked at the same cohort, um, looking uh, with uh, Dr. Zwart and her colleagues at NASA. And we found that the ones with those risk alleles that the astronauts had, and these um, participants on Earth, the ones with the risk alleles actually had more disc edema. So it really kind of lends credence that perhaps these are true risk alleles that, um, that can potentially worsen the process. Um, this is a potential way we could try to mitigate some of the changes uh, in space is actually using a lower body negative pressure. And here what we're doing is um, using suction to kind of pull pressure down into the legs and maybe that might restore the gradient that um, astronauts have because essentially it's microgravity that causes the papilledema. So, you know, could this be um, a potential cure? And so we actually created a lower body negative pressure box that's made of pure plastic. So we could do simultaneous uh, lower body negative pressure and, uh, and MRI to look at brain changes. So pretty exciting times. You know, we need to get this obviously figured out if we want to be able to send astronauts to Mars uh, for longer space travel, because the longer the space travel is, the more um, they develop these changes. And obviously, we can't have our astronauts all blind when we're out in space. So we're trying to get this sorted out here. So I only have four minutes left. And um, really, a, I wasn't, I was going to actually speak skip optic neuritis because it's so time consuming. I, I you know, give lots of lectures on optic neuritis. Uh, I think I can probably um, chat about the other ones very briefly and then have time for, for questions. And if people want to stick around, I could go through optic neuritis as well. But uh, just very briefly in terms of C stands for congenital and inherited. So we've got essentially two inherited diseases that can affect the optic nerve. And so this is a 17 year old male with acute painless vision loss in the right eye. And two weeks later, they had acute vision loss in the left eye. And what you see here on exam is they've got central scotomas in both eyes, uh, 2200 both eyes. And the optic nerves look a little bit hyperemic, no frank disc edema, but some potentially telangiectatic vessels. And this is really classic for Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. The genetic testing was positive for 11778, which is the most common mitochondrial mutation response for labors. And one year later, unfortunately, this patient ended up count fingers in both eyes with bilateral pallor. So labors typically affects males between the age of 10 and 30. Women only account for 10 to 20% of cases, but they can be affected too. Patients present with acute, severe, painless sequential vision loss with the central scotomas, the classic presentation. And on exam, you may see hyperemia of the nerve with these parapapillary telangiectasias, but we often call this pseudoedema because on fluorescein, they actually don't leak. So it's the pseudoedema that they get. But up to 50% of the patients can actually have a normal fundus appearance when they lose the vision. So you can't depend on this appearance to make the diagnosis. You really just have to have it on your differential diagnosis of that acute painless vision loss with these central scotomas. 90% are made up of um, these three mutations in 11778, 3460, and 14484. It's maternal inheritance because it's mitochondrial inherited. And the treatments are, um, we often offer idebenone, um, which may improve outcomes. Uh, there's ongoing clinical trials for that. And then what's very exciting um, is the potential of gene therapy. Uh, and we've got genetic trials for the 11, 7, 7, 8 mutations. Um, and there was both the reverse and the rescue uh, clinical trials. And what's interesting is they found some mild improvement in both the treated and the untreated eye. And so there, it, right now, it's, it was kind of, I guess the results weren't as ex uh, promising as we hoped. We hoped we, you know, we would reverse all that vision loss in, in the treated eye. Um, but really what's interesting is both eyes had some mild improvement. And the question is whether the gene therapy actually affected both eyes or is the natural history a little bit better than we thought. Uh, again, the thought is perhaps it really did somehow um, treat both eyes. And there's other trials ongoing. 
and hopefully we'll have a better treatment for this devastating disease in the future. Autosomal dominant optic atrophy is the other uh, genetic mutation that can affect the optic nerves. And these patients present much more differently than labors. They present with very gradual insidious vision loss. The classic presentation for these ones are um, patients who feel like their vision is completely normal, but they fail the driver's license exam. That's just a classic way to present because the vision loss is typically mild, so gradual that they don't notice it. Most retain vision better than 2200. They'll also have small central scotomas. They'll have temporal optic atria or diffuse pallor on exam. And it's, um, as part of its name, it's autosomal dominantly inherited. It's got variable penetration and expression. Uh, the most common mutation is OPA1. And commercial testing detects about 50% of mutations. So um, again, laborers, autosomal dominant optic atria are the two most common um, inherited optic neuropathies. Again, we're going to skip optic neuritis, but again, if, if we want, Sean? we can chat about it later. Sean? Yes. Don't be concerned about the time. We have time, okay? So uh, are, are, you, are you sure? Yeah, yeah, continue. Okay. In that Sean? case, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll go through optic neuritis as well, because really the traumatic endocrine psychological, that's a span of two minutes. So okay. it really will be done. Don't worry. Don't worry, we have time. Okay, um, so in that case, I'm just gonna go ahead and talk. I'll, I'll go through optic neuritis as well. Um, again, that's something I'm pretty passionate about. Uh, but really the last three here, traumatic endocrine psychological, those are, those are breeze. We really don't have any updates on those. Um, you know, traumatic optic neuropathy, we know it's caused by trauma uh, to the head globe or orbit where you can either have direct traumatic optic neuropathy from avulsion of the nerve or laceration. And then you can have indirect from blunt trauma where the nerve kind of just gets gets hit that way. Um, it's probably more common. Unfortunately, vision loss is severe. Um, we don't have good treatments. Um, at first, the optic nerve looks normal and then it becomes atrophic. Um, treatment's unlikely helpful. So really no updates there, so, so pretty quick. Um, endocrine, metabolic, there I've got the vitamin B12 folate deficiencies. Uh, really no big updates there, but just have to think about it. For any patient with kind of gradual progressive bilateral symmetric vision loss, have to think about potential nutritional deficiencies, especially vitamin B12 and folate. They're going to have these central scotomas. Um, and we most commonly see this in alcoholics or patients with some kind of short gut syndrome. And that includes bariatric surgery. So if they have a history of bariatric surgery, want to have this on your differential diagnosis. And then finally, if you don't find any uh, etiology, we've got psychological, which is functional vision loss. The good part is we've got tests to try to, um, uh, to essentially diagnose functional vision loss. This is just a, an example of an OKN drum. And you can see this is actually one of my, one of my former residents uh, just kind of demonstrating um, the normal uh, response. And if you have these saccades to the OKN drum, it indicates that the vision has to be at least 2400. So that's a nice tool. Um, you can also use stereopsis. Uh, stereopsis obviously is looking at 3D vision, but to be able to see the fine detail in that ninth circle, you actually need to have very good fine visual acuity in both eyes. And so that's in just another way you can demonstrate good vision in patients with functional vision loss. And we've got a bunch more tricks in, in, up our sleeve, but we can diff usually prove that a patient has functional vision loss. And again, um, it's, it's been an hour, but I'll go ahead and talk about my favorite topic. Um, and obviously, if, if you have to be somewhere, um, feel free to jump off Zoom. Um, don't have to stay on here. But if, if you have time, I, I'd love to chat about optic nerves. Uh, it's something I'm pretty passionate about. Yes, we have time. Okay, great. Um, so optic neuritis, um, it's something we're all going to see because it's the most common acute optic neuropathy in young patients less than 50. And uh, patients classically present with subacute monocular vision loss. 90% of them are going to have pain with eye movements. They're going to report dyschromatopsias where colors aren't quite as vibrant. And uh, Two-thirds of the time, the disc is actually normal when you look at the nerve because it's a retrobulbar optic neuritis. And classically, if there is disc edema in a third of patients, it's typically going to be more mild, similar to this picture here, kind of a grade one disc edema. 
The good part is that division tends to improve over one to three months, and 92% um, of patients improve to 2040 or better. And unfortunately, some patients can still end up with poor vision. About 3% can end up with 2200 or worse. So not all patients improve, but the vast majority do. I tend to tell my patients that 90% of patients will get about 90% of their vision back. You want to look for atypical features, which is if it's bilateral, if there's prominent disc edema, if there's a lack of recovery. Those are some atypical features of optic neuritis that will make you want to think about some potential other etiologies. Um, so this is your differential diagnosis of optic neuritis. The classic optic neuritis is going to be multiple sclerosis. That's going to present with your typical optic neuritis. And then we've got other demyeling disease processes that will cause atypical optic neuritis, like neuromyelitis optica or NMO, and MOG um, antibody-related inflammation. And then we've got other etiologies of optic neuritis, uh, inflammatory autoimmune, such as sarcoid lupus, uh, granulomatose with polyangiitis, infectious processes like Lyme, syphilis, and TB, and idiopathic. I'm just going to briefly chat about these three demyelinating processes. I think a lot of what we know about optic neuritis came from the optic neuritis treatment trial, which finished in 1991, and this was published in the New England Journal of 1992. Essentially, it found that high-dose IV methylprednisolone speeds the recovery of optic neuritis but actually doesn't change the visual outcome. Whereas low dose oral prednisone alone potentially increased the recurrence rate. So at the time of the optic neuritis treatment trial, when you had a patient with optic neuritis, you had two options. One is to do nothing, or the other is to treat them with high dose IV steroids to speed in the recovery, knowing that you're not actually changing the visual outcome. The other important thing about the optic neuritis treatment trial is that um, at the time, the main dichotomy was, you know, what is your chance of having multiple sclerosis with about an optic neuritis? And it did a wonderful job of answering that. It found that 50% of patients after a bout of optic neuritis will develop MS <clears throat> within 15 years. And you can further stratify that risk depending on the presence or absence of white matter lesions on MRI. Whereas if there are no white matter lesions, there's only a 25% chance of developing MS but if you do have white matter lesions, there's a 72% chance of developing MS. And if there's more classic lesions, there's a higher chance. And this is a patient with just classic periventricular white matter lesions coming off the ventricles. You can see why they call these Doc, uh, Dawson's fingers, because you can see they look like fingers coming off the ventricles. Again, classic for multiple sclerosis. I'm going to touch briefly on neuromyelitis optic or NMO. This was first described by Devick and Galt in 1894. And the classic symptoms are severe relapsing optic neuritis and longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. And so this is a patient with optic neuritis in the right eye in the past with count finger division and a very pale nerve. And unfortunately, optic neuritis in the acute optic neuritis in the left eye now 2400. And classically, what you see with the transverse myelitis is this longitudinally extensive lesion. You can see here that this extends five vertebral segments. So anytime you see a transverse myelitis extending more than three segments, that's classic for NMO. If you compare that to an MS lesion causing transverse myelitis, you can see it's much shorter. And because of this profound inflammation of the spinal cord, they have much worse symptoms. It causes much more disability in terms of um, of function and uh, also disability in the vision as well. For the longest time, there was a lot of debate whether NMO was a distinct entity. Uh, this was just you know in 2007, not that long ago, where you had multiple arguments, say, multiple experts saying it's a variant of multiple sclerosis and many experts saying it's not a variant of multiple sclerosis. The NMO is its own distinct entity. Ultimately, the answer came from the lab. Um, in 2004, uh, Dr. Lennon at the Mayo Clinic and colleagues found that the NMO antibody against aquaporin-4 was both a marker and a pathogenic cause of NMO. And that firmly cemented NMO as a distinct entity from multiple sclerosis. So now we know it's truly a separate entity. And when the aquaporin-4 antibody 
um, it actually gets created in the serum. And then during um, bouts, attacks of NMO, the acupoint 4 accesses the brain and it actually binds and actually activates complement and astrocytic injury. And that's how it causes its disease. And um, the acupoint 4 antibody is very sensitive and specific, or at least very specific for NMO with over 99% specificity. And it's actually interesting that the serum is actually more sensitive than the CSF because again, the acupoint 4 antibodies are actually made in the serum before they get access to the brain. Dr. Wingerchuk came up with the diagnostic criteria in 2006 that was actually fairly easy to remember. Um, it included optic neuritis and transverse myelitis, which of course are the two most common ways NMO can present. And you had to have at least two of the following. You either had to have a long transverse myelitis, an MRI non-diagnostic for MS, or a positive acupoint 4 antibody. But of course, now that we've got a specific biomarker of the disease, the disease spectrum actually expands. And so this is the new diagnostic criteria published in 2015. And you can see it's obviously much more complicated than one I just showed. But I'd like just to boil down to a couple key points. The core clinical characteristics remain optic neuritis and transverse myelitis. Those are the two most common. But the second most common way NMO spectrum disorder can present is actually with areoposteremia syndrome, where you can get a lesion within the medulla and patients present with unexplained hiccup or vomiting. And this is very important to recognize because this could actually be the very first way NMO can present. And so these patients can go to the ED or to a GI doctor and get a million dollar GI workup, but actually the problem's in the brain, in the medulla. So you just have to have that on the differential diagnosis. NMO, um, the other core clinical characteristics are acute brainstem syndrome, symptomatic narcolepsy, and symptomatic cerebral syndrome. And to make a diagnosis, you have to have one of the core clinical characteristics and a positive acupoint for anybody. And you can make a diagnosis of seronegative NMO spectrum disorder, but you have to have two core clinical characteristics, and one of them has to be uh, one of these three most common ways that NMO presents. And so that's our new diagnostic criteria. Well, why do we need to know about this as ophthalmologist? It's because of its propensity to affect the optic nerve and how devastating it can be. It, um, NMO optic neuritis is more severe with less recovery. Um, about, as, as I mentioned before, MS, only about 3% end up with 2,200 or worse, whereas NMO, it's anywhere between 33% to 50% can end up with that blindness. Um, it's more commonly to present simultaneously or rapidly bilateral involvement or chiasmal lesions. So it can cause bilateral blindness. The transverse myelitis can lead to paraplegia. The brain strain and diencephalon lesions can actually cause uh, refractory hiccups, non vomiting, but it can even cause respiratory failure. And with all these lesions together, you can actually have mortality. There's been a study that reported mortality as high as 32% but fortunately now with better recognition of disease and better treatments, I'm sure it's closer to 6%, perhaps even lower, but it's a fatal, it can be a fatal disease if it goes untreated. When you have an attack of NMO, you wanna treat with IV corticosteroids and add-on plasma exchange because the attacks are so severe, attacks have poor recovery. Um, we treat with IV steroids and plasma exchange. And um, again, so that's different from the optic neuritis treatment trial um, where you know IV steroids were there to speed in recovery. Here, these patients need IV steroids as soon as possible and then usually plasma exchange for an acute attack. Another large difference from this from MS is that all patients need to be treated with immunosuppression agents. And rituximab is by far the most common medication that we use. If you're going to take one thing away from this talk, you have to know that MS medications could actually potentially increase the risk of relapse rate in NMO. And so it's so important to be able to think about NMO when you have a patient with optic neuritis, because if you misdiagnose them with MS, put them on you know, something like Rebif or one of these MS disease modifying agents, you could potentially even worsen the disease. Um, so it's going to be important to think about disease and treat them appropriately. The American Academy of Neurology actually called 
Enemo the disease of the year in 2019. And that's because there were three separate randomized clinical trials showing efficacy of three separate new medications. The first one that was published was from the PREVENT study where they found that echolizumab, which is a complement inhibitor, led to a 94% reduction in relapse rate. And it became the first FDA approved medication for animal spectrum disorder for aquaporin 4 positive disease. And um, this was an amazing study because it actually looked at the pathophysiology of how NMO causes disease, which is the aquaporin 4 antibody binding to aquaporin 4, activating complement and causing the astrocytic damage. So echolizumab, a complement inhibitor, actually impedes that, um, that order of, of, of disease and led to great outcomes. Um, next, we had the NMO momentum study, which looked at enobolizumab, a CD19 inhibitor, and this also shot, showed a significant reduction in relapses compared to placebo, and this was published in the Lancet. And then lastly, we have the Secure Star study, which looked at satralizumab, an IL6 inhibitor, which also showed a significant reduction in relapse in aquaporin 4 positive NMO spectrum disorder. It was not effective for the seronegative NMO spectrum disorder. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So that's essentially NMO in a nutshell. Um, I'd like to end on um, MOG um, associated disorder, MOG antibody associated disorder, which is you know, really one of my passions. Um, it's the newest described biomarker. Um, and so we're still learning more and more about this disease condition. I thought I'd start off with just a classic case of MOG optic neuritis. This is a 48-year-old male who presented with blurred vision and pain in both eyes. And you can see here that this patient had bilateral, pretty significant disc edema. And so this patient was actually seen by one of my residents in the ER. Um, this was several years ago before MOG was becoming mainstream. It, it was a little bit lower on people's differential diagnosis. So he saw those swollen optic nerves. They were bilateral and said, Dr. Chen, I've got a patient with a pretty significant bilateral papilledema. I think we need to get an MRI, MRV, and spinal tap because I'm concerned about raised intracranial pressure. But this patient actually had count fingers in both eyes. And they also had pain in both eyes, pain with eye movements. And, you know, obviously those nerves are swollen, but if this were papilledema, you wouldn't expect count fingers vision. So instead of a MRI, MRV lumbar puncture, I think this patient, I recommended this patient getting an MRI of the orbits dedicated to look for optic neuritis. And what you can see here is that this patient had bilateral optic nerve enhancement that was very profound. It was profound enough that it actually extended into the optic nerve sheath and the parabulbar fat. And so this was bilateral optic neuritis. And it was atypical optic neuritis because bilateral was rare in adults. There was a lot of disc edema. And so the initial workup included a lumbar puncture that showed no, no oligoclone bands, aquaporin 4 antibodies were negative, and the infectious inflammatory workup was negative. The patient was treated with IV methylprednisolone for five days. They had almost immediate recovery of vision, faster actually than you'd expect for typical optic neuritis. Uh, for typical optic neuritis, if you treat them with IV steroids, they tend to get recovery in, you know, about three weeks instead of six weeks. But this patient, you know, on day two, day three of the IV steroids, they were essentially back to 2020. So it was actually almost too good to be true. Unfortunately, when we tapered off the steroids, he relapsed. And then when you treat him with steroids, he got the vision back, tapered off, he relapsed. And so clinically, this was chronic relapsing inflammatory optic neuropathy because it was steroid responsive, but it was actually a steroid dependent optic neuritis. And the patient ultimately was stabilized on azathioprine 100 milligrams twice a day. Finally, when we had the MOG antibody testing, it was not surprising to find that this patient was positive at a titer of one to 100, which is a very strong, or it was just a good positive um, test. <clears throat> so that's a classic case of MOG optic neuritis. So MOG stands for myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, which is a transmembrane protein found on the surface of oligodendrocytes in myelin. And it's been speculated that antibodies against MOG have been thought to be involved in demyelination for many years because it's one of the most commonly used models of demyelination in animals, the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. 
And so it's been thought that these MOG antibodies have to play a role um, in demyelination, but it just wasn't understood how until recently, because we now have a cell-based assay. And that's what allows us to detect MOG in a much more specific fashion. And at least in the US, it first became commercially available in October of 2017. So we've actually had this antibody commercially available in the US for less than three years. Um, over this past year, we've had a couple more labs that are now offering cell-based assays. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of a newly, newly described entity, but we're starting to get a better handle on it. There's numerous ways that it can present. Um, optic neuritis is the most common way it presents, especially in adults. And it can be single optic neuritis, recurrent optic neuritis, or it can have that steroid dependency. And it ex explains 25% of chronic relapsing inflammatory optic neuropathy. It can also cause transverse myelitis. And some of the transverse myelitis lesions can be long. So this is a long lesion here extending five segments. And so if you have optic neuritis, you've got transverse myelitis, especially with a long segment, that meets the diagnostic criteria for animal spectrum disorder. It actually explains about a third of Aquapon 4 seronegative NMO based on the 2015 diagnostic criteria. Obviously, the new diagnostic criteria is going to separate out MOG and Aquapon 4, uh, but currently, since the 2015 diagnostic criteria was made before we really had an appreciation of MOG, um, it, it can still meet the criteria and explains about a third of, of seronegative NMO. The other way it can present commonly is acute disseminating, disseminated encephalomyelitis, or ADEM. And this is more common in children, where, where patients can get this diffuse CNS inflammation here. And these patients can present with headaches, confusion, encephalitis. And, um, you know, these patients can present very profoundly, sometimes with bilateral optic neuritis, calling blindness, uh, encephalitis, confusion, headaches. Um, these, these kids would present to my clinic when I first started the Mayo Clinic before we had this antibody and keep me up at night because uh, they're bilaterally blind. They had this diffuse inflammation brain and you know we're trying to decide is this infection, inflammation. And ultimately, a lot of these patients, we bit the bullet and gave them steroids and they responded beautifully. And in retrospect, all these patients were probably mock antibody disorder. We just didn't know it at the time. And it's really nice now that we've got a biomarker for MOG antibodies that we can test and confirm our suspicion. Many of these patients in the past even ended up with a brain biopsy because we just didn't have a good biomarker. Um, another important thing to note is it's not multiple sclerosis. Um, patients with classic multiple sclerosis are, are very rarely positive for MOG antibodies. So it really is its own distinct entity. In terms of the way it classically presents for ophthalmologists, it's going to be optic neuritis. And about 50% of the times it's bilateral, 50% of the time it's recurrent, and there's going to be some steroid dependency in some patients. Discodema is another clue that will make you think, well, maybe this is going to be MOG optic neuritis. It, there, it's present in up to 86% of patients, unlike MS, where it's only a third of patients. And sometimes it can be severe. Um, the discodema can be severe. So anytime I see an optic neuritis with this much discodema, I'm thinking, well, maybe this is MOG. Another useful um, tool is MRI for possibly suggesting MOG optic neuritis. 50% not only have optic nerve enhancement, but they'll actually get optic nerve sheath and peribulbar fat enhancement, which we call perineural enhancement. So if you see that, um, that's a pretty good sign that it might be MOG optic neuritis because you don't classically see that with MS or Aquapon 4 NMO. In terms of the visual outcomes, um, MOG optic neuritis presents with severe vision loss. Uh, typically, they present with 2400 vision, count fingers vision, so pretty severe. Uh, early on, it looks pretty similar to Aquapon 4 NMO, but the good part is the recovery is much better. And so um, this is a study where we looked at recurrent optic neuritis, and, and this is the probability of retaining, um, a probability of developing severe vision loss. And in blue, this is Aquaporin 4 NMO. And so with the recurrent bouts of optic neuritis, the chance of developing severe vision loss is very high. Now, a lot of these patients develop severe vision loss. 
Whereas with, with MS and MOG, uh, MOG is in pink, you can have these recurrent bouts of optic neuritis, but the majority of patients actually retain pretty good vision. Only about six to 20% of patients ended up end up 2200 worse with MOG compared to up to 50% for aquaporin 4. So again, at onset, the vision loss is severe, but the good part is the recovery is much better. So in terms of acute attacks, we typically treat them with IV methylprednisolone, 1,000 milligrams for three to five days. And I typically follow this with an oral prednisone taper over one to two months. And that's because some of these patients are steroid dependent and you don't wanna have that flare up when they come off the steroids too quickly. So I tend to do a slower prednisone taper. And that's how I approach these patients with mock optic neuritis a little bit differently than I do with an MS optic neuritis. I only consider plasma exchange or IVIG if the vision loss is severe and there's no recovery with the steroids after you know one week or potentially two weeks. Um, whereas um, you know again this diverges for MS, you know whether you treat or not um, with IV steroids, uh, the outcome doesn't matter. The IV steroids just quicken the recovery. For NMO, you want to treat them with IV steroids and plasma exchange, and for MOG you're gonna treat them with IV steroids, only add on plasma exchange or IVIG if you need it. Um, the chronic immunotherapy also diverges um, from NMO. So with um, MOG, if you've got a single attack, um, we don't typically treat with chronic immunotherapy because only 50% are gonna relapse. And even if they do relapse, the recovery is much better. So you usually can rescue that that vision or rescue that myelitis symptoms much better. So if they've got a single attack, we don't typically treat. Um, so therefore, long-term immunotherapy is only required for relapsing disease. Again, completely different from aquaporin-4. If you've got aquaporin-4 NMO and you've got a single attack, you need to treat because 75% of the permanent deficits that occurs in aquaporin-4 NMO happens from relapses that happen over time. So they have to be on chronic immunotherapy. Whereas patients with MOG disease, we're only doing long-term immunotherapy for patients with relapsing disease. If you are gonna treat them, um, we typically use rituximab or azathioprine as our first line, often with a low dose um, maintenance oral prednisone. And patients with severe relapsing disease that break through rituximab or azathioprine um, we have some recent studies suggesting that monthly IV IG is actually very efficacious for MOG associated disorder. Um, there was a recent meeting in Germany, and, and we discussed this as well, and many of the experts of MOG have also found that monthly IV IG is a very good medication for preventing relapses and ones that kind of break through. Also of note, medications, the classic ones for multiple sclerosis, uh, medications are not effective for MOG, but they probably don't worsen the disease course like they can with NMO. So just going to do a quick recap, kind of comparing multiple sclerosis, NMO, and MOG. Uh, the demographics are a little bit different. Um, for uh, NMO, it's typically be a little bit older, um, female predominant. Um, Black and Asians are more affected than Caucasians, whereas in MOG, it can affect any age and sex children, about 20% of demyeling disease in children is actually explained by MOG. Um, so far, it can affect any race. We don't think there's a racial predilection yet, but more studies need to be done for that. In terms of the vision loss, of course, that's what we care about as ophthalmologists. Um, for NMO, you've got the severe vision loss at onset, poor recovery. With MOG, you get severe vision loss at onset, but typically good recovery. The disc appearance and the MRI findings can also help lean you toward one or the other. With, with NMO, um, less than a third have disc edema. If you get this isolated optic chiasm involvement, that can maybe think, make you lean toward NMO. Whereas with MOG, 80% are going to have disc edema, 50% are going to be bilateral. And if you see that perineural enhancement, that's going to make you want to think about MOG. MOG can also affect the optic chiasm. Um, we'll have a study coming out on that in, in a little bit with similar percentages to NMO. But when MOG affects the chiasm, it tends to be an extension from a large, long lesion that does, that extends to the chiasm, where Acoperform 4 more, more commonly just affects the chiasm in more in isolation. The transverse myelitis can also help differentiate from multiple sclerosis, where it's typically shorter, 
for NMO and MOG, they can both be long. And other lesions in the brain can help tip things off. The periventricular for MS, area postrema for NMO, and ADEM for MOG. And so these are just kind of easy ways of kind of differentiating these different demyelinating diseases when you see a patient with optic neuritis. You always want to think about these categories because, again, not only influences prognosis, but influences treatment. So I just have to keep these on the differential diagnosis. And so that's essentially a nice, uh, this is essentially my approach to what I think about when I see a patient with vision loss. I just kind of step through Vindicates. It allows me to look through different classes of etiologies to make sure I'm not missing something. Um, and so uh, these are potential etiologies that you want to think about anytime you have someone with an optic neuropathy or vision loss. So I had a, a really good time um, chatting with all of you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? This has been a wonderful trip through, through vision loss. I want to return to the beginning of your lecture, to ischemic. Yes. Uh, do you, what do you think about uh, glaucoma and non-ischemic, non arteric ischemic optic neuropathy sharing risk vascular factor? Is that the same factor acting in different way or in different um, optic nerve? What do you think about that? Well, that's a very good question. I, I do think they share mechanisms for sure. They're both hypoperfusion, they're both ischemic, especially normal tension glaucoma, it's gonna have a lot of the same vascular risk factors. You don't typically see NAON and glaucoma in the same patient because the glaucoma patient has ischemic, probably some chronic ischemia, it leads to that cupping and therefore there's space for the blood vessels so you don't acutely have that NAION type picture. But the demographics are very similar. Older patients um, oftentimes have vascular paths um, nocturnal hypotension may be contributing to both etiologies. Yes. So, no, I agree. I think the vascular risk factors are the same, but it's interesting because, you know, that risk factor for NAON um, is that tight nerve, you know, obviously you don't see it typically in the same patient. Yes. Questions, Roberto? Uh, Thanks for giving me the chance to ask a question. The uh, presentation was excellent. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, for sure, I will discourage my patients with uh, intracranial hypertension to undertake NASA space trips. Uh, <laughs> we all know that uh, for sure. Uh, but uh, my question is uh, whether or why you decide in such a patient with uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension to send them for stenting. Yeah, so what are our indications for stenting? So uh, essentially, it's always medications first. And I guess I, I should have made that more clear. It's weight loss and medications first. For stenting, it, it falls into that, that category of patients who fail medical therapy. Um, they've got chronic grade one papilledema, grade two papilledema, severe headaches, and they're on max medical therapy and we just can't get them the papilledema to go away. And so six months later, one year later, they're still struggling with a lot of side effects from the medications, a lot of headaches. Those are the ones that we typically do venous sinus stenting on. Um, it's, it's because it's probably a little more safe in our hands than a VP shunt. It's actually lowered our threshold for surgery. Obviously medications first and foremost. And then we occasionally would do VP uh, um, optic, uh, the uh, venous sinus stenting. It's not without um, risks. You know, there's still that 1% chance of hemorrhage and stroke. So, of course, medications are first. Uh, and then, as I chatted about earlier, if they're fulminant grade 5 papilledema, we're not going to venous sinus stenting either just because there we want the pressure down as quick as possible. So that's going to be VP shunt or optic nurse's penetration. Uh, don't want the blood thinners to interfere with things with a venous sinus stent. Terrific. How would they do? Uh, you mentioned you have more than 100 cases. How would they do in the visual perspective? From an ophthalmology standpoint, they've done really well. And essentially, I don't think there's a single patient that did not have improvement in the papilledema. From the headache perspective, that's a different story. Um, you know, I think the ones that had, you know, grade three papilledema, pretty severe papilledema, those uh, did actually very well with the headache and the papilledema, both improved a lot. 
the ones where they've got kind of very mild papilledema, really prominent headaches, probably a lot of their migraines, it did resolve the papilledema. So at least we can say we got rid of the raised intracranial pressure portion, but a lot of them still did have headaches. Um, again, it was helpful for these patients because at least we can say, well, the papilledema is completely gone now. Let's focus on the migraines. Let's focus on these other forms of headache. Mm -hmm. um, so from an ophthalmology standpoint, they did great. Headache, hit or miss. Uh, Sean, a question from Zoom. Uh, do you think that this patient uh, need um, anti-aggregation or anticoagulation with a stent? Yeah, so we, we, we do. We, we do Plavix for three months. Our, our standard is Plavix for three months and aspirin. And we do a, a CT venogram three months after the stent to make sure there's no thrombosis of the stent. So okay. aspirin and Plavix, and then they're on aspirin indefinitely. And again, that's why we don't typically use this for fulminant IAH because um, they have to be on Plavix for a while and that makes it hard to do other surgical procedures. Okay, uh, another question, giant cell arteritis. What do you think about temporal echodoppler <laughs> diagnosis? That's interesting. That's a very good question. These ultrasounds for temporal, ar temporal arteritis, uh, it's commonly used in, in Europe. Um, our experience at, at Mayo has been a little less, less good. I, there was actually interesting, there was actually a, a chat about it on Nanosnet recently, uh, just talking about people's experience with it. Um, I had a, a patient last week who had arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy in eye with pallid disc edema. The fluorescein showed delayed cortical filling, CRP was 50. That was all just classic for temporal arteritis. I knew it was, it was giant cell arteritis. Uh, because of COVID, I didn't want to do the biopsy. I thought, you know, why don't we just get the ultrasound, prove that it's giant cell arteritis and go ahead and treat. So I called them up ahead of time and said, I talked to our vascular ultrasonographers and said, this has to be giant cell arteritis. It's just classic. And they could not find it. Couldn't find a hint of it. So I said, okay, well, mark the area that you checked and we're going to biopsy the exact same spot. And we did the biopsy and it was ragingly positive. <laughs> and so it was just, it's just odd. Um, I, I don't, believe, the, I believe that the, the observer is very important. Yeah. The experience with a Godoppler. Uh, yeah. And I have patients that in, very interesting when I begin to train the week by week, the Doppler change it and mm -hmm. improve. But you must do it uh, earlier. Just okay. Diagnosed. Yeah, but, it, uh, the, the, the experience of the observer is very, very important. A hundred percent agree. You know, some people, some studies quote 90% uh, sensitivity, you know, it's very in 90% specificity. And so I think it really depends on the, like you said, the experience of the ultrasonographer. And um, I know we're doing a study now where we're actually going to start doing ultrasounds on almost all patients before biopsies, just for, for one, to see what our experience is, and two, hopefully get better experience with it. Okay. Um, okay. Great, and, great good and question. question. And do you perform Doppler of posterior ciliary arteries? I think the posterior ciliary arteries are hard to get at with the ultrasound. It's just too small. The, uh, the closest okay. thing that I, I feel like we have is a fluorescein angiogram looking at the choroidal filling. So uh, again, the, the choroid is is supplied by the posterior ciliary artery. So if you get that profound delayed choroidal filling on fluorescein, that makes you think that there's some kind of inflammatory occlusion of the posterior ciliary arteries to support giant cell. It's so viable. It's difficult to, to have a good, good echography. Uh, you say, if you search calcium in every disc edema, with regular ultrasound, I can understand. Maria Julia, aclarame. <laughs> I, I can't understand the question. The, uh, he well, asked, I was asking if, if he do regular ultrasound to, to distinguish drusen from disc edema. Uh, oh, yes. Yes, so, so in terms of pseudopapilledema, what kind of ways do we distinguish pseudopapilledema from papilledema. Yeah, I, I, I like ultrasound a lot. It's it's very good for detecting um, optic distrusion. 
uh, we also use autofluorescence, OCT. Um, those are really kind of the three mainstays. Uh, but I, I like ultrasound a lot. Okay. And, and also when we do ultrasound, we look for optic distrusion, but I also have our ultrasonographers actually measure the optic nerve sheath diameter. Uh, it's not perfect, but um, you know, if you've got a very dilated optic nerve sheath that can make you think more, you know, raised intracranial pressure. Um, yes. So, you know, they're already there looking for the optic distrusion and I just have them measure it as well. It's difficult with ultrasound. We have the 30 degree tests, but it's yep. very difficult to perform. In, in, in boys, it's also difficult to distinguish Drosen. I think OCT will, will help us with the lazy V sign and those signs. OCT yes. helps the ultrasound performers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, we typically, we often get multiple imaging modalities. It's not uncommon. Pretty much every patient I see has an OCT. So I always have the OCT. And then sometimes I'll either add on ultrasound or auto for us, since depending on you know, what mm -hmm. we're kind of looking for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Another question. Do you think that MOG antibodies are pathogenic or a marker of the disease? That is a million dollar question. Um, we don't know yet. Uh, we know it is a excellent marker of the disease, so that it's still important, but we still don't know if it's pathogenic or not. Uh, we know Acuporin 4 antibodies are pathogenic for MOG antibodies. We, we don't know yet. Um, excellent question. Um, yeah. Some animals suggest, animal models suggest it is, some animal models suggest it isn't. So um, if it is pathogenic, we, we actually don't know um, the mechanism yet. We don't know if it act activates complement. There's so many things we still don't know. Okay. Well, a lot of thanks for you, uh, for your time, your excellent lecture. We, are, uh, we have made a long trip to Vision Loss and you are very kind with us. So um, I don't think there is more question. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for um, the opportunity to, to talk with all of you. I had a great time and it was great seeing you. I know not in person, but it was great seeing you all uh, virtually. And yeah. I, I hope to see you all again soon sure. in person. Um, yes. You know, I, again, I had such a great time last year when I visited Argentina. Yes, thanks a lot. Bye to all. all Bye. Right, take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.